you have a moral obligation of some sort. You might say, well, you've decided that yourself. And the answer to that is, like, no, wrong. You haven't decided that yourself. Are you kidding? You'd be a complete psychopath if you decided that by yourself. Right? I mean, if you're even the vaguest bit civilized, then you decide what it is that you should do, or what you should do manifests itself within you as a context of a dialogue that you're continually having with yourself, but also with everyone around you. And not only, only with everyone around you, but with the entire hi history of mankind. Do you believe that there are things that you should do? Like, is there anyone here who doesn't believe that? Or more importantly, is there anyone here who doesn't act like they believe it? So you wake up in the morning and you think, yeah, there's a bunch of things I should do. Or there's some things I should do next week. Or there's some things I should do with my life. Yes? That's a common thought? Does anyone not think that way? Okay, so, you know, if you don't think in that way, you end up pretty depressed because then you think, well, there's nothing I should do with my life. And that's not such a happy thought because life is hard and then if there's nothing to do with it, well, all you're there stuck with is a bunch of suffering and that doesn't seem like a very good idea. We're all historical creatures and, you know, what you think you should do is being shaped by what your parents think and that was shaped by what their parents thought and that was shaped by what their parents thought and so on back into the depths of history as far back as you can possibly imagine, both historically and biologically. So in some sense there is a call to action within people. Now you know in any sort of quest story, like The Hobbit, let's say, um, or The Lord of the Rings for that matter, you know, the story always starts with, with a call to action, right? For some reason or another the little Hobbit character, which by the way is you, you know, the Hobbits live in this little protected place and they're not very big and they're not very smart and they don't know about the wide world beyond them where the great forces of good and evil are at combat and one Hobbit who's a little bit more adventurous than the rest gets called to act, gets called upon to act and in, in the Hobbit stories, it's usually the wizard who manages it, right? So it's a magical figure of some sort who's extraordinarily wise and extraordinarily old, who might as well be God for all intents and purposes, who says, you know, it's time for you to go and become a thief. Be well, that's what happens in the Hobbit, right? It's a very weird thing, because obviously that's Frodo, right? Frodo's the Hobbit in, in the Hobbit, and Bilbo's the Hobbit in the Lord of the Rings, if I remember no, correctly. Other way around? Bilbo is the hobbit in the hobbit. Fine, Bilbo. Okay. So Bilbo gets called to action and he's going to go, he's going to go find a dragon. Well, the dragon is the same thing that swallowed Job. It's the same story. And the, and the dragon has a treasure, which is a weird thing. It's like, what's up with dragons, right? What do they hoard? Virgins. That's the St. George story. It's a very, very old story. Or gold. And that's weird behavior for a predatory lizard. But anyways, you accept that without any problem. Of course a dragon lives underground in a big mountain that was excavated by dwarves and sits on a treasure. It's like, we, go to, we don't have any problem with that idea. Well, why? Think, I mean, really? You really believe that? And the answer is, well, well enough to read the damn book and to make the... I mean, how many people went and watched The Lord of the Rings? How many people... And think about it worldwide. How much money did uh, Harry Potter generate? You know, I bet you Harry Potter generated more money than the remaining steel mills in Britain if you calculated it across the, the amount of time since those stories emerged, right? So, of course, there's a lizard in, a uh, predatory lizard in Harry Potter, too. It's the thing that skitters around underneath Hogwarts and turns you to stone with the glance of an eye. Oh, and does that lizard hoard virgins? Well, what's the name of the woman, that the girl that he... Uh, Kidnaps. Ginny. Right, okay. What's the word Ginny from? Virginia. Right? <laughs> Good. Good. Right. And he, she's Harry's first love interest, and he, he rescues her from the damn snake. And he gets paralyzed while, paralyzed while he's doing it. What rescues Harry? Phoenix. Right? A phoenix. Okay, so the basilisk bites Harry. And so he's going to die. The phoenix comes along. Who owns the phoenix? Dumbledore. Yeah, yeah. What does the phoenix do? Cries. And it cries into Harry's wounds. Yes? And what happens? Then what happens to Harry? He comes back to life. It's a res death and resurrection story. So the thing that's willing to die and resurrect is the thing that gets the virgin from the snake. It's like, 
Does that make sense? Well, you think it makes sense, even though you don't really know why it makes sense. And then what happens to the, what happens to the phoenix after it does that? It burns itself up into, in a puff of flame and is reborn. So it's the story told twice. The thing that dies and is reborn is the thing that conquers the, the serpent and, and, and rescues the feminine, roughly speaking. So it's not gold in that situation, but it doesn't matter. It's the same story. It's always the same story. So and, and when you don't hear... culture isn't providing you with rich stories of that sort that are derived directly from your tradition, somebody like an unemployed welfare mother in Britain has it pop up full-fledged in her brilliant imagination and lays out seven books and makes herself more money than the queen. <laughs> right, right. And that, you know, it's a Cinderella story. It's a bloody amazing story. And then there's all those books and all those kids learn to read because of the books. And then there's all those movies and everybody goes and sees them and no one notices that they don't know what the hell they're doing while they're doing it. And it follows the same old story. All right. So you've got your individual, that's you, the hero. Then you've got the adversary to that. That's your enemy, wherever that enemy might happen to be. That's the forces that oppose you, oppose you but mostly psychological forces. of one form or another. Then you've got the father. Well, there's two kinds of fathers. What kind? Good fathers and bad fathers. So, here's an example. Um, the Lion King. So, the Lion King has a father, right? Uh, Mufasa. And Mufasa has a brother. Who's his brother? Scar. And what's up with Scar? Not a pleasant guy. Partly maybe because he's scarred. Something's hot. Well, really, eh? He's kind of skinny. He said he came from the shallow end of the gene pool. Obviously, something's happened to him because he has this scar. He's arrogant and brilliant, which is a very common set of attributes for negative father figures. And he's out to do in the king. So what does he represent? Well, you could say, and here's a way of thinking about it sociologically. One of the things you hear very frequently, I, I'm sure many of you have heard this ad nauseum, is that there's such a thing as the patriarchy, right? The patriarchy. Well, okay, the pat patriarchy is a mythological construct. And I mean that, I mean that technically speaking. You have a, a paternal figure that basically represents, it can represent the father directly, or it can represent the structure of male power. It's not just male power, but whatever, for, for the time being, we'll, 
we'll stick with that. It has a positive aspect, which is why you get to sit here and you're not being snowed on and freezing to death. So that's the positive element. And it has a negative element, and the negative element is the arbitrary tyranny that's associated with any social organization. 